production support for In Focus is provided by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to Central and Southern Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. The Herald Times local news app for iPad, iPhone, and Android. Use it to join the community conversation. To find the Herald Times news app, go to your app store and search Herald Bloomington. And by viewers like you. Thank you. The state discovered last month that millions of dollars in income tax revenue was incorrectly withheld from counties because of a programming error at the State Department of Revenue. The state has since returned that money, but since the mistake is just one of several that have seen nearly half a billion dollars of state cash misplaced or misappropriated, we'll talk about what state officials are doing to try to prevent the mistakes from happening again on this edition of In Focus. Good evening, I'm Stan Jastrzewski. The state of Indiana repaid counties more than $200 million in April after an error was discovered in the way the Department of Revenue calculated its tax distribution. As WTIU's Gretchen Frazee reports, the state says it is now working to restore confidence in its funding system. The state collects income taxes each year from residents in each of Indiana's counties. That money is then redistributed to the counties to be used for public services, including road maintenance, libraries, schools, and fire services. This year, the state found out it owed the counties $206 million more than it gave them. State officials attributed the mistake to a computer error in the Department of Revenue. Local governments say because they didn't have the money earlier, they had to make cutbacks that affected a number of departments, such as law enforcement and maintenance. The Director of Government Affairs at the Association of Indiana Counties, Andrew Berger, says his organization is still learning the full impact of the error. Obviously, in some counties, especially those that had some, I think, tight budgets to begin with, I mean, they may have had to lay off employees, not fill positions, um, maybe ask their employees to contribute more for their own health care, uh, you know, deferred road maintenance or something like that could, could have occurred. Soon after the error was found, government officials began calling for an independent audit. Senator Luke Kenley is a part of the state budget committee that is organizing the audit. He says the bipartisan group is trying to make sure errors like this don't happen again. You know, it could be that we need to look at our system and say, do we need to have a better, more upgraded system? Um, I think from the testimony that we took at the first meeting that clearly it looks like the internal procedures of the Department of Revenue are going to have to be beefed up and it's probably going to cost us some money to hire the people to do those things. In addition to these changes, representatives from both the State Budget Committee and the Association of Indiana Counties say there's a need for more transparency throughout the entire tax process. You know, a taxpayer in uh, Howard County or in Monroe County, uh, in Bloomington's case, you know, they pay what happens to that dollar <laughs> all the way down through until it gets back to Monroe County, back to the city of Bloomington. I mean, if we can get full transparency on that, I think we're going to be happy with the audit process. The committee meets again next month to decide which company will conduct the audit, which should be complete by the end of the year. And we're joined in studio tonight by three guests. They are Republican State Senator Brant Hirschman, who sits on the state's budget committee. Also, Professor John Mikesell, who teaches in Indiana University's School of Public and Environmental Affairs. And Monroe County Councilman Jeff McKim. Thanks to the three of you for being here. I want to start actually with another piece of tape we have from Senator Kenley, who you saw in our opening package. And he's talking here about finding some of the errors and, and what has to go on there and how the process has been, uh, you know, kind of meted out in terms of finding the errors. And then we'll come back after after that with a little graphic that kind of explains to our viewers what some of those errors look like. Uh, the, both errors have come out of the software and computerized systems that we've installed since about 2008. And prior to that date, you actually had no record keeping. So now what we have done is gone to an accountability system that was more than it had ever been done in the history of Indiana, and, but it's showing that we have some flaws there. Senator Hirschman, uh, I'd like to, to start with you uh, talking about some of the errors, and we're talking about you know, hundreds of millions of dollars here kind of going back and forth. 
what from your perspective on the state legislature and, and, and on the state budget committee can lawmakers do to ensure that these sorts of problems don't happen again? Well, a great deal. We want to work cooperatively in a bipartisan way to exert oversight on the process to determine exactly what went wrong, why it went wrong, and what steps we need to take to make sure that it doesn't happen again. I'm pleased that the administration proactively stepped forward and announced that they had discovered the error. They immediately paid the money back with interest. Uh, however, this is the kind of problem. We've seen a, a couple of instances of this, and it is a significant amount of money. And it begs the question, how can we do our job better? And I think that's why we're in uh, unanimous support of the outside audit, to have people step in and say, OK, not only what mistakes have we made, how can we correct them? What are best practices nationwide? And I think there are some pretty key areas that we're going to find to look into. I'd like to look at that graphic real fast. We have a, a little graphic here that shows kind of what some of the errors were from, from the state in terms of the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and you see there the overpayment uh, to local government and income taxes, that money eventually taken back in bits and pieces. The state then finding uh, corporate taxes and income taxes that need to be, uh, you know, re rejiggered somewhere to send back to, to different places. Um, Professor Meixel, you're, you're part of the committee, uh, or have been, that has looked at how the state comes up with its formula to estimate its, its revenue and what the state is going to take in, which helps decide what's going to eventually go back to counties and back to municipal governments. Is some of the problem here due at all to the fact that over the last at least four to five years since the beginning of, just before the beginning of the recession and even to now, frankly, even with a couple of different formulae, the, the budget projections haven't been close each month? Well, I'm not sure that uh, the, the problems that, that uh, we're looking at now uh, were uh, great causes. We do know that uh, the numbers that we were using for uh, corporate income tax history were, were incorrect because of the money that was uh, uh, collected but never showed up on, on the books. Uh, and uh, we know now that since sometime in calendar 2010, uh, the uh, division between uh, county income tax and state income tax uh, that division has been has been incorrect, um, but um, probably not enough to explain the the errors that uh, we had in the forecast uh, back a couple of years ago. We're we're back on track uh, with a decent forecasting record now, um, and uh, uh, we were still using the bad data uh, in large measure when we got back on track. So uh, I, don't think, I don't think I can blame our, uh, uh, all of our difficulties with the forecast on uh, uh, the Department of Revenue, although it's always tempting to try to find someone to blame, but I'm not sure that one will stick. Uh, Jeff, I think the, the tendency, at least from the municipal government side in, in recent years, has been to kind of put the onus on state government. But let me ask you, are counties doing enough to prepare themselves through rainy day funds and other measures that if there is a glitch in the way the state is meeting out money to the counties, that the counties can be ready to absorb such a thing and can in fact provide perhaps a stopgap? I mean, are, are counties ready enough or are there other things that county governments should be doing to be more ready to, to understand that this uh, money projection is exactly that, a projection and it's not a concrete number? Well, let me, let me first address that and then I'll come back to the question you're actually asking about the rainy day fund. But with, with respect to income taxes, we're actually not really talking about projections because this is money that's already been collected. The, the way mm -hmm. that uh, local income taxes work is that the money is collected between, uh, by the state from, from uh, July to June and then is paid out to counties not till the following January over with 12 monthly payments from January to December. So essentially, we're talking not about projections or guesses. We're talking about money that's actually already in the bank, already been collected, and so the determination of how much it is and, and who should get it is really just, uh, it should be just a matter of simple mathematics. It's not, it's not about projection. Now, the question is, can counties do more to be, uh, to be more robust with respect to errors like this? Sure, I mean, we, we are fortunate in Monroe County that we've built up substantial reserves. And so we've been in a position where we have um, both a decent operating balance, which allows us to continue to make payroll even if we receive less than we had expected. And um, we also have a, almost a $6 million rainy day fund. 
which would allow us to absorb and be able to deal with downturns for, for a, an amount of time. But you know, not all counties are, have been, been that lucky or have had the resources to do that. Uh, you've probably heard of the property tax caps that were recently enshrined in the Indiana Constitution. And um, Monroe County is also fortunate mainly because of our high property values and low tax rates that the property tax caps have not taken a large bite out of, uh, out of our own local government revenues. But, a lot of other uh, communities are not nearly so fortunate, and I certainly do know of other counties that have had to lay off staff and um, make reductions in force, and I, th I think, as you mentioned, take uh, perhaps make a, a greater contribution of employees to, re to the employee retirement or even cut wages. I want to play another piece of tape for the three of you and, and for our viewers. We spoke with the Bartholomew County Auditor, Barb Hackman, who was talking to us a little bit about not just you know some of the big errors, but we've talked to a couple of auditors who've said, look, there are uh, lots, of, lots of little things that maybe the public doesn't know about. It was a huge amount of money, and it's just like if that error happens, how many other errors, you know, could possibly be happening? And and a lot of the, you know, auditors, what we what I heard was they were very, you know, upset because it did cause, you know, they might not be in as well as a financial shape as Bartholomew County. So it could have really affected their counties more because of the shortfall in monies that they have for budget purposes that, you know, if they were having to struggle, you know, struggle, you know, like we in this case, you know, we had given a 2% raise, but in their case, they might not have been able to give a raise or even possibly had to lay off employees. So that, in that case, I can see they were very, very upset. So we heard Senator Kenley earlier say that there haven't always been audits of these individual departments. We've heard from a couple of county auditors who say they're kind of wondering what errors there might have been otherwise in the past. Uh, I'd like to ask this of all three of you, starting with you, Senator Hirschman, we'll go down the panel. Are there times now where we need to get back into what has happened in the past? Is it more prudent to focus on how we change these things going forward? How do we provide an audit structure going forward? Both of those, neither of those, what do you think? I, I think they're both relevant. Uh, you need to look back at historical uh, occurrences to give yourself a sense of where we've been, but you also can't drive your car by looking in the rearview mirror. You have to look forward as well. In this case, I think the state has done a great deal towards transparency. Uh, several nationally uh, recognized groups have given Indiana an A grade for the transparency initiatives that we've enacted in recent years to try and put data out there so elected officials and the general public can take a look at it. As far as internal audit functions, it's my understanding the Department of Revenue didn't have an internal audit function until 2008. We've made significant progress, but we need to take a deeper look to give people and elected officials the confidence they need that the system is working as intended. Professor Maxley, your thoughts going forward? Uh, well, certainly uh, the, the great concern is looking forward, uh, and we know that uh, the answer is uh, improved uh, internal controls, uh, more regular system checks within, uh, within the Department of Revenue, uh, and, uh, and greater attention to uh, uh, exactly what's going on within, within the systems. Uh, now, both of the, the big recent uh, uh, errors were discovered by state government. Uh, the, <coughs> the, the problem with uh, uh, corporate income tax payments uh, was discovered uh, in the Department of Revenue. Uh, the uh, problem with uh, county income tax was discovered uh, in the tax review uh, division of the state budget agency. That's the, that's the group that, that handles the, uh, the distribution. Uh, basically, the tax review group uh, looked at the numbers and said, these don't make sense. Uh, Department of Revenue, go back and check again. Uh, and. Uh, uh, they initially didn't get a response, and they said, well, go check. And finally they did check, and lo and behold, uh, they found the problem. Um, so we don't really want to correct the past. Uh, we need to fix, fix the future. And uh, uh, the, the review, the outside review, I hope, will, uh, uh, will identify the kinds of routine system checks that the Department of uh, Revenue needs to do in order to make sure that its work is, is accurate. It needs to make sure that it has the right internal controls in place to, uh, to do it. 
uh, we don't want uh, perpetually to be looking backward to correct errors. We want to look forward uh, to make sure that we're preventing the errors. Jeff, does that sound okay from a countywide perspective? A absolutely. Um, I mean, we, we certainly need to make sure that uh, we're starting when we're starting with future dis income tax or future revenue distributions. We need to know that we're starting from numbers that we can trust. So if there are still errors in the past that haven't been identified or corrected, that they still need to be identified. But from the perspective of of where we re really need to put our focus, it, it's got to be not on recriminations in the past and pointing fingers. It's certainly got to be about coming up with with systems that make sense for the future. And checks and balances are a critical part of that. And that, that goes across all levels of government. I mean, we have the same issue in, in local government. It's you know, the, the statute sets up all these different independent elected officials, assessors and treasurers and auditors that are all supposed to provide checks and balances to each other. But yet, locally, we had our own, uh, our own error in which uh, an error in the auditor's office resulted in the loss of a million dollars in property tax for the, uh, for, for the county. And so obviously the checks and balances weren't good enough. And so we all need to use these, these problems as, as a um, learning opportunity to set up structures that will work in the future. So let me, let me ask, ask you and then ask Senator Hirschman, how do you come up with these checks and balances structures where you feel like it's a cooperation between county government and the state government and you don't have to feel like, for instance, it's, it's Big Brother looking down on one entity or the other. How, how do you get that cooperation between the two without anyone feeling like they're being the, the lesser of the two? Um, well, it, it's, part of it is certainly about cooperation, but you also need to have somebody, you, the checks and balances need to be somewhat independent of each other. And you need to be able to have uh, different people, different, different organizations who have access to, to, the, to all of the information, who are computing it in different ways and making sure you come up with the same answer. I mean, that's, that's what, what we find a lot. You don't want to just repeat the calculations that the other person, uh, that the other organization did. You want to have access to all the raw data so that you, uh, a, as the check or balance, are, are able to, like I said, just kind of do the calculations in a different way, uh, work through the processes uh, through different slices, but make sure you come up with the, uh, with the same answer. And Senator, about the cooperation? I think trust and cooperation are, are the, the foundational elements. And one of the things we did as the State Budget Committee was to reach out immediately to the Indiana Association of Counties and the Indiana Association of Cities and Towns, had them put together a working group of their members who are cooperating with us as we examine the data and collaborate to try and find improvements. I think we're waiting to see what the outside auditor finds, but I would suspect it will be a combination of some infrastructure improvements in terms of our information technology, as well as some additional process changes to ensure that we have checks and balances in the system. And we want to partner with local elected officials in coming up with those solutions. You mentioned the IT side. You know, the $300 million error came from the fact that a computer program that was supposed to be taking the money, and it's essentially funny money because it's electronic money at this point, taking it from one pot of money and moving it to another, we right. found that $300 million of that did not happen. And so I wonder if there is, and, and uh, Councilman McKinn mentioned the idea of the whole calculation aspect of this, I wonder if there are processes that would be smart to be put in place that not just have a computer calculating these things, but actually have humans working with a pen and paper trying to figure out some way to, to make sure that these calculations are correct. And it gets me back to a question that I was pondering this morning, which is, is this needlessly complicated in any way? Is there any way this can be streamlined or simplified such that it, you're not missing a small step somewhere in the middle of the process that ends up as the $300 million error? Um, I think we will look at ways to improve the, the system. However, I would caution people, this is far more difficult than one might think. This is six and a half million people in the state. We're collecting billions of dollars in taxes from a diverse uh, group of sources, and we also have to attribute that money to the appropriate county level. You know, you pay your taxes, you have the end of the calendar year, you pay your taxes in April. We have to process those returns, and then we have to determine where that money should be distributed 
to each county appropriately. The reconciliation process is very complicated, and literally the computer program is millions upon millions of lines of computer code. So it, it's a lot more complicated than one might think at first blush. I was thinking, uh, uh, Councilman McKim, you mentioned the property tax caps, and and on on their face, at the very least, the tax caps. You know, you've got the three, two, one structure with them. Theoretically, they make at least that sort of math easier you to, to figure out in, in the middle of your head, but it's it's deeper than that, and Professor Mike is shaking his head. Um, so is it deceptive in some ways to to try to understand these these concepts and, and, and even to try to explain them to people who you serve on a local level who want to know why this is going on? Is, is it hard to explain to them, I, hey, it's gonna, how much time do you have? I find it exceptionally difficult uh, to explain to people. Um, I mean, just just as as a kind of a simple example, the way the property taxes are calculated in Indiana is sort of in the reverse of the way that every other every other kind of tax is calculated. Where other kinds of taxes, you have a base and a rate, and you multiply them together, and you get the tax. But in Indiana, with property taxes, you start with the total amount that local governments are allowed to tax, and then you divide that by the assessed value, and that's that's your tax rate. And so. Having people understand that, for example, when property values increase, that does not re uh, result in local governments getting more tax revenue. And people don't, under I mean, it's very difficult to, con to convey that. I mean, we hear all the time that uh, assessors have an incentive to inflate uh, assessed values because it, because it would result in greater tax revenues for local governments, but it doesn't. If, if an assessor inflated uh, one particular, if an assessor systematically inflated uh, assessed values, all it would mean is that the tax rates would go down. Professor Michael, a second ago you were you were shaking your head when I was talking about the idea of of trying to insert some simplicity into this structure. No, we took we took simplicity out of the structure <laughs> when we went to one, two, three, but that's okay. That uh, the voters wanted it, and so we'd have to deal with it. Uh, instead of having one rate uh, that uh, that applies everywhere, we have the concern about uh, uh, the one percent, two percent, three percent which ultimately has to go down to the individual individual parcel level. And that's a level of complication that, that we never, ever had before. Uh, Monroe County is, uh, is uh, a bit blessed because we haven't really started to hit the, uh, the, the cap levels. Uh, uh, your, your job will become more complicated if we get to the place where we start hitting the caps. Then, then, uh, then you'll say, uh, oh my goodness, uh, you'll, you'll have uh, not, not only uh, uh, taxpayers calling you up, you'll have everybody else calling you up saying, what have you done to us? Uh, Jeff, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, has the, has the state lost some, some trust from Monroe County government or other county governments, do you think, because of this? Or is it just a, a growing pain as, as this sort of problem gets itself worked out? I, I think we've always been, at least as long as I've been on the council, um, we've always been frustrated with uh, being able to obtain information in a timely manner from the state. Uh, from the state. I mean, there is always, we are always having to deal with a great deal of uncertainty, in, uh, uh, particularly in the income tax revenue numbers. Uh, so I, I, I mean, this, this, was, this was another error. We were, of course, uh, quite relieved that the error was in our favor. I mean, it, it made a substantial difference to Monroe County. I mean, we, we received, mm -hmm. $2.7 million extra for 2011 and uh, $3.6 million for 2012 for all of Monroe County local governments when this error was resolved. So, uh, you know, in one sense, uh, I, I think that the anger would have been much greater had the error been in the other direction. <laughs> but, uh, but as it is, uh, it, it, it's, we, we very much have, have had to get used to the idea of making decisions without necessarily being able to rel rely on the numbers we're getting. We have a graphic I'd like to put up now about some of the counties that were most impacted by, by some of these uh, the financial dealings back and forth, and we can have that up as I ask my next question first of Professor Mikesell and then of, of Senator Hirschman, and that is, uh, is there a way for the state to ensure that there are safeguards? Are, are there more checks and balances, as we said earlier, that need to be put in place, and are there more ways to maybe slow the process down from time to time to get through those million lines of computer code such that we, you know, have fewer of these and then fewer surprises from all the way from the revenue projection stage to the handing out of money. Uh, are there more safeguards, Professor, that need to, to, need to be put in place, do you think? Well, we, 
we've we've reduced one of the com complexities uh, in the Indiana system. We we do the certified distribution process so that counties do do know how much money they have to spend uh, for the for the budget year. Um, we don't we don't force counties to have to do forecasting of, of how much money is involved. <coughs> the problem is getting the distribution right. Uh, but once the distribution's right, then you've got, then you've got certainty. Uh, you, you can't absolutely eliminate errors. Uh, there have been some instances in other states uh, where there have been uh, uh, similar misdistributions of, uh, of uh, uh, local, local revenues collected by the state. Uh, the, the best you can do is to have the system together as well as possible and um, to, to have uh, uh, sort of smell tests going on along the way. That's, that's how the budget agency found this mistake. What do, you, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, the numbers didn't look right. Uh, they, they knew the patterns of... Uh, uh, of uh, uh, County income tax collections to particular counties. Uh, they were able to do some reconciliation between those numbers uh, and some other sources of, of uh, uh, income, so they knew what the pattern should look like, and they didn't look right. You know, that's not that's just the smell test. It didn't didn't look right, and so they they kept pushing revenue to say, do some more checks, do some more checks. And then they finally found it. Senator Hirschman, and then we'll give Jeff a chance uh, to yeah. weigh in. I, he, uh, Professor Mexel's right, and I think there was an external force that may have masked the problem uh, that was a little unusual, and that was the national economy. Mm -hmm. In both of these yeah. cases, the corporate tax collections appeared to go down. While they were going down because of the national economy, it's just they were, weren't going down quite as quickly as we thought they were. This was literally a historic downturn in the state and the national economy. And so when we looked at those numbers, a lot of things, uh, we didn't have a historic smell test to compare it to because we were seeing trends plunge so quickly. And that trend hit county and local governments later due to the way the system works than it hit yeah. the state. So the state, you saw, lost billions of dollars of revenue. The county started to see that same loss a year later. And so it masked some of these internal problems. Yes, we can improve the process, but I think this was in some ways a, a perfect storm of events. All right. Well, it's a, it's a complicated topic, but my thanks to the three of you for helping us sort some of those those things out. And it's a, a topic I think we could we could talk more about uh, on another show. Thanks also to all of you who watched and listened tonight. Please send us your questions for next month's program if you, if you like. That email address is infocus at indiana.edu. You can also leave a question or a comment or see portions of this program at indianapublicmedia.org slash infocus. And do join us next month. We'll talk about Indiana's marriage laws. Have a nice night. Production support for In Focus is provided by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to central and southern Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. The Herald Times local news app for iPad, iPhone, and Android. Use it to join the community conversation. To find the Herald Times news app, go to your app store and search Herald Bloomington. And by viewers like you. Thank you.